Hello, how are you? Hey, Mark, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. No, I think it's super cool that we're doing it. Thanks for asking. I'm massively honored. I've never, um, I don't think I've ever spoken to a general before in my life. So we're not that impressive. I don't think you have to worry about it. We're just normal people just like you. No, I love it. And I was seeing that um, you recently retired, right? I did. Yep, two months ago. That's amazing. And I I was reading some on your post uh, that you have, is it Capital Leadership? It is. So I've got a bit of a schizophrenic brain. And so there's a lot of things going on under the umbrella of that company. Okay. Uh, but I think it's headed towards something that is important and big and good. Yeah. And I'm just hoping that it all comes together in the right way at the right time. Would you say that's kind of what's next for you is capital leadership or like, what are you looking forward to over the next few years? Yeah. So I retired specifically because I think there's something far more impactful I can do for people and our nation yeah. than staying in uniform. Yeah. And so it required me taking the risk to get out of uniform. Mm. And I think I know what that is, but I'm not mm. quite ready to say what I think it is. Uh, but nice. all of these things, writing a book, doing some keynote speaking, being on a board, doing some consulting, doing some pro bono leadership development on the Hill, I think are all going to converge in the right place at the right time. And I'm excited to see how it plays out. Well, I'm excited to follow along and see how God opens doors and moves through you. He already has, but it's kind of a new chapter of life for you, you know, and so it's, it's going to be beautiful. I'm really excited. Well, I'm, this is, this is the first time, you know, that I've ever done anything like this. (laughs) So I'm excited about it, but the questions, you know, they'll probably adapt and evolve over time. And thank you for helping me with the order. I thought that was really cool. Um, But if you're okay to jump in, I would love to hear some of your thoughts on these questions. Yeah, Mark, let's do it. And by the way, I know you just turned 30, so happy birthday. 30. In in addition to retiring a couple months ago, it was a few months ago that I turned 50. Unbelievable. I've been thinking about some of these deep thoughts just like you. Yeah. I think I'm just at halftime. I think I've got 30 more good years of impact ahead of me at least. And so uh, so you probably are at a pivotal point in your life and career as you turn 30 and you're thinking about the impact you can make in the future. And so hopefully some of this can be helpful to helpful to you and whoever you decide to share it with. Thank you so much. We're both reaching milestones. Thank God. But yeah, here we go. It's exciting. (laughs) So what the first question is like, what do you want to be known for? Yeah, that is an awesome question. And frankly, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of times in life where we get stuck looking at the short term and missing the forest for the trees. Mm. Um, I set a mission statement for myself about a decade ago that I wanna maximize my impact on people in our great nation. Yes. And so really, I think the answer to your question is that I wanna make sure that in all of the major categories of my life, that I'm making the maximum positive impact that I can. And that's as a Christian, as a husband, as a father, as an American, as a leader, as a friend, as a servant, in all of those areas in the right way that I can balance all of them or Mm. harmonize all of them, Mm. I want to have the best possible impact that I can make and that I believe I was designed to make. I love that. That's something right now that really resonates with me of reaching my maximum impact, but also keeping a pure heart and pure motives while I do that. Sometimes my my selfish nature wants to go and pursue certain passions and I just want to make sure those are aligned with my values and what's truly important in life. So as I hit 30, I'm asking myself some of those questions. What is truly important? What do I want to spend my life and my time doing? And yeah, what you said really, really resonates with that. Um, well, I actually think you're spot on there, Mark, that mm. none of what I said means that I'm doing this for any self-serving purpose. Mm. Now, we've got to fight against the flesh all the time, but my desire is to make sure that I do something with my life, not be somebody in my life. And Mm. that's a pretty interesting duality there where there are people that focus on becoming something and there are people that focus on doing something. And there's a different path there. And the reason as I labeled those categories to you, I labeled Christian first, is that that grounds us so that we realize none of this is for our own glory or our own honor, it's to the Lord. And if we keep that focus at the beginning of our day, and as we mold the important topics that we're talking about today, that it centers us on doing something instead of being somebody. That's beautiful. Um, I was, for number two, I was at a talk one time and the speaker said, turn to your neighbor and ask them, what is success to you? And then when everyone was done in 10 minutes, he said, it's really interesting. Everyone probably said something different, right? It's crazy how success is somewhat subjective. I mean, what are your thoughts on what success looks like in life? 
Yeah, so very much it's if you are fulfilling your purpose in life. Hmm. And that doesn't mean that there's some magical end state and it takes the entire life to get there and only then can you tell that you're successful. It is true that until you finish successfully, you finish fully, you can't really look back and say you were a success. Hmm. But the success is not the end state. It's not a position. It's the journey. And yes. so to me, it very much is the case that if I am in those categories, fulfilling my life's purpose by using my skills and talents and experiences and relationships in the right way to satisfy those priority areas that I talked about earlier, mm. then I can consider myself a success. Not because I get to a milestone or I hit a promotion uh, increment, but because day by day I'm living consistently the best I can in accordance with those priorities and the principles that are foundational to it all. That's amazing. And if you could uh, tell me a little bit about some of the, because I know you're a general in the Air Force and an MIT graduate, and there's so, so many other milestones in your life or things that a lot of people from the outside in would say, well, that's a lot of, a lot of success and some amazing things that have happened. But like, what would you attribute some of that to? And how, how do you think you got to some of those milestones and reached some of those things? So, so Mark, again, an awesome question. As I retired a couple months ago, there's a big ceremony. I had mine on the 21st of November. Hmm. And leading up to that ceremony that could be extremely emotional because I'd invested 28 years of my life in service to my country through the United States Air Force, you reflect a lot on why you got to where you got to yeah. or why did you stay in. And I kept coming back to the people that had invested in me. Yes. And that means family, and that means friends, and that means colleagues, and that means coworkers, and that means spiritual leaders, and that means secular leaders. Mm. And I think it was your dad that taught me mm. that somebody becomes the sum total of what they read and what they watch and what they listen to yeah. and the people they surround themselves with. Yes. And so it's not that us as an individual got somewhere because individually we are amazing and we put on our Superman or Superwoman cape and achieved something. Yes. It is that we harnessed in the right way all of those experiences, relations, and opportunities in an intentional, deliberate way mm -hmm. so that we could get the most out of it, so that we could give back the most to others. Yes. And so I think the key to success is being intentional about what are your priorities and how are you going to best achieve those day by day, week by week, month by month and year by year? And how are you going to do so in an integrated fashion, not as stovepipe <clears throat> priorities, because that's not integrated. And that means it's not integrity. Integrity means a whole. Hmm. And so to me, it is deliberately structuring your life with a goal, and with boundaries mm -hmm. and then pouring in the time and financial resources so that you can best achieve your purpose today, but also as you're headed down that path to somewhere that is important. So good. I have heard my dad say that probably over a hundred times, you know, growing up, the books you read, the people you're around and the things you watch and listen to. And as I've grown older, I think Atomic Habits, you know, talks a little bit about your inputs, like determine your reality. So get really intentional about what you're, you know, taking in with social media and TV and your friends. And you talked about that intentionality and then creating those systems so that you can ultimately achieve success. But a lot of that God has given to us of who, what we choose to spend our time doing and who we choose to spend time with. So that's very, very interesting. I love that. Yeah. One other addition to what I just said, Mark, Yeah. there's a three word phrase that is the motto of a organization in the Air Force called the Air Force Weapons School that okay. develops the tactical and operational leaders of the Air Force. And that three word phrase is humble, approachable, incredible. Mm. And we think a lot about success as the credible and that's necessary, but not sufficient mm. because if we're not humble and approachable, then we're not going to learn such that we can be better tomorrow than we were today. And if we're not approachable, then no one is going to be able to learn from us such that they can be better tomorrow than we are today. And so I think a big part of success, in addition to setting those intentional goals and boundaries and resources, is to realize that our maximum effect comes from the credibility 
but then the humility and the approachability so that you can grow yourself and allow others to grow by them learning from you. And so all of yes. those things I think weave together yes. with what you watch, what you listen to, um, yeah. what you read and who you surround yourself with to create this life where now you realize that all these things are influencing you and you can allow them to influence you for the good or the bad. And it's important that you're intentional about setting those boundaries so that for the most part, you stay down the right path and you allow them to influence you for good and not the other way around. Love it, love it. What are some of the biggest challenges that you faced and how have you overcome those? Yeah, so it's interesting as, as you say that and there's a few things that pop to my mind and to some extent they're still raw but to some extent they're still powerful because of their positive impact that they had on me. Hmm. Um, you probably are tracking that yesterday was the 20 year anniversary of the space shuttle Columbia uh, disaster. Hmm. Right. And I remember very vividly what I was doing on that day. I had just started test pilot school hmm. there in Southern California. I just started going to Lancaster Baptist Church at the time. Okay. Uh, and I was learning how to be a test pilot. And that was part of my lifelong goal. But on that Saturday morning, I was filling out my first application to be a NASA astronaut. I was literally sitting at the kitchen table. The news wasn't on, but we heard the news and then we turned on the TV. And as I was filling out that application, uh, I was watching the results of that disaster that took place on February 1st, 2003. Hmm. And I think back to my goals growing up as a kid, literally as young as I could remember, I wanted to be an astronaut. Wow. And I never really reassessed as I grew up because I'm a pretty stubborn kind of guy, mm -hmm. whether that was the right goal for me or not. Right. But I was determined, in fact, I saw that uh, accident, that disaster, and it didn't deter me at all from filling out that application hmm. because I had had posters of the space shuttle on my wall growing up and it's what I always wanted to do. And right. I applied and found out that a kidney stone I had several years prior to that had permanently disqualified me from being an astronaut. Ugh. And that literally rocked my world, right? I went to college in the location that I did and the studies that I studied in part primarily because I wanted to be an astronaut. Wow. And I joined the Air Force in part because I wanted to be an astronaut and as a fighter pilot and a test pilot, all of that. And then that door was shut. Mm -hmm. And the benefit to that uh, and it goes back, I think, a little bit to what Winston Churchill said, I think, which is a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Hmm. That was an opportunity in my life to do two things. Number one, it really softened my heart to the point that I realized that I needed to become a Christian, that I needed to accept wow. Christ as my savior because I hadn't up to that point. And so it really stirred my heart and my soul to realize that there was something extremely major that was missing in my life. But then because I had always wanted to do that, I had never really reflected on why. And today I still think it's the coolest job in the world. And if someone gave me an opportunity to go to space tomorrow, I would do it in a heartbeat. But I loved the idea that at that moment, what we talked about earlier, wanting to do something instead of be somebody really became apparent to me. And when the door was closed to be an astronaut, I realized that that's something that I couldn't be. And I wow. didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew then, and that's when I really crystallized the idea that I wanted to maximize my impact. Amazing. And so that was extremely helpful, really, in shaping the entire of my life. You think about that kidney stone, that mm. big changed my life. It actually changed my eternal destiny in part because it softened my heart. But then it also helped me focused, uh, focus myself to be a better servant. And then ultimately, the next one that pops to mind, if you don't mind me sharing another I one. I love it. Uh, it's all getting raw, but it's all good raw, so it's okay. It. <laughs> um, fast forward six years after that, and I was the director of operations of a unit that was responsible for testing the F-22 Raptor, the world's most capable fighter. And I got to be the second in charge of that organization. But on March 25th, 2009, during a flight test, we lost an aircraft and we lost a test pilot. His name was Dave Cools Cooley. He was a friend, he was a mentor, he was a colleague. And that was an extremely tough time in the squadron, not only for me to mourn myself, but then to help lead that 700 person organization through that crisis. Hmm. And then I had the ability a couple months later to move up to be the commander of that organization. Hmm. And I think on 
day 11, my boss brought me in and said, hey, dragon, that's my call sign, dragon, you're not the guy. Huh. And I mean, what do you mean, sir? What does that mean I'm not the guy? He said, you're not the right person for this job. Um, I didn't hire you because he was brand new. Uh, and I said, well, sir, it sounds like you should fire me. And he said, no, I can't, I'm stuck with you. And then he gave me a book, How the Mighty Fall, which wasn't a very affirming book as I read it. And then he said, get out of my office and I left. And it was an extremely tough night as I went home and I talked to my wife, Melanie, and said, hey, this is what happened. And we came to the conclusion that likely my Air Force career was over back then in 2009. Mm. And I may have a limited amount of time being the leader of that organization. But while I had the time, it was an opportunity to be the type of leader that they deserved. And I didn't need to worry about myself because my career was over. And so it was never going to be any more about me and could be completely about the organization. And though miraculously I got promoted out of that job, it was a rocky two years, but I think that I learned the opportunity to lead in the right way, in a selfless way. And I was forced to do so in part because uh, I wasn't gonna get promoted and I didn't need to worry about me. Now things worked out in a miraculous way and it truly was miraculous. Yeah. But I think that helped me to understand the power of good leadership mm -hmm. and the type of leadership that sets aside selfish ambition and does the best for the people and the organization um, that you're in control of. And so those wow. two major wow. crises in my life yeah. shaped my eternity. Uh. They shaped my view on being and doing and it shaped mm. my view of what good leadership was all about. And all along the way helped me realize that I'm so dependent upon the Lord in everything that I do, mm. Uh, mm. that it's best just to make sure that that foundation is as secure and sound as possible because everything else stems from that spiritual component of your life. Wow. Well, that is, that's amazing stories and so, so inspiring. I did not know those things about you. And it's such a challenge to me um, that, you know, when things happen in life that we just don't understand or that seem to rock our world, like you're such a beautiful example of someone who said, okay, like, let's, you know, let's, let's get back to this and let's make the most of this and let's grow through this and become who God has created me to be, even though it's maybe a little different than what I desire. And, you know, a lot of people in, in, you know, in my age, uh, bracket are like, <laughs> what does God have for me? And they want to do a certain thing. I know I've felt that several times over the past few years. So what you just said really challenged, inspires me. I just wanted you to know that. And I just, it's not to, easy, yeah. Mark. It's not like I woke up the next day and said, wow, I've got this leadership challenge, right. you know, I'm going to rock it. it. It's not that way. It was a yeah. gut wrenching two years. Wow. And the astronaut example was a gut wrenching year. Hmm. Uh, but the key is that every step you take day by day is going to uh, enable you either to use that to the future benefit of God's glory and your impact, or so it can good. allow you to diverge from your spiritual and practical foundation in a way that becomes unhelpful. I love it. Um, what do you think about going to how do you motivate and lead your team? Yeah, so that also, you're, you've got the awesome questions, Mark, and I appreciate <laughs> each of them. I think there is an innate desire in humanity, in all of us throughout time, to have two different things, to be loved or cared for, and to live a life of purpose. Mm. And I'll talk probably a little bit about this idea called servant leadership, but I think mm. essentially it means that if you are a leader and if you want to maximize your influence on your team, mm. then you're going to focus on caring for them as individuals and how you can help them become the best possible version of themselves. Yes. And that's the love part. And then there's the purpose part, and that's uh, related to how you communicate as a leader. And what I mean by that is that when you're in the trenches and you're doing a job, sometimes you forget the fact that it's something that maybe ties to a greater purpose. And it is mm -hmm. the role of a leader wow. to help those throughout the organization to understand the important purpose of why they are doing something and how it connects to something bigger than themselves. So and if you are a leader that genuinely cares for people and you are a leader that helps them understand they are part of a higher purpose, 
then now you unlock this natural human potential mm. within our spirit that can wow. allow them as individuals to grow and succeed. And along the way, your organization will thrive as a result. So good. So good. I was just listening to uh, John Maxwell, one of my favorites, and obviously one of his statements, and it can be a little cliche, but it really rings true is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And you need, even if you're not great at emoting that, your different type of leadership, a uh, leader, maybe you need to find your leadership DNA, but within all that, you can find some way. You know, my, my dad has challenged me in that. He, he really shows people that he loves them, that he cares about them, that intentionality to reach out, you know? And ultimately, man, people want to, to serve that, you know, and, and grow there. And then what you said as well about communicating purpose and vision and being a part of something that truly matters, that's something that I have not done well and with people that I work with or that I, you know, that are under me in some way. And that's something that, man, I definitely need to, to do better at. I love it. Sometimes it takes a little bit of creativity hmm. in your own mind as a leader to understand the higher purpose of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, but once you do that, then if you help the other members of your team to do that to their subordinates and yeah. you do that for them, then I think it really provides a level of motivation that would be absent uh, apart from that. And then back to the genuine care and concern, mm. you know, one of the things that is a hit on servant leaders is that maybe they don't have standards or they're too soft or they're just trying to be your friend. Mm. But I believe a real servant leader who loves or genuinely cares for their people and wants them to become the best possible version of themselves, employs a range of leadership techniques. Sometimes they're the fun ones of inspiration and encouragement, or sometimes they're the neutral ones of equipping or challenging or convicting. And sometimes they're the not so fun ones of correcting. Yeah. But if I really care for you, then I'm gonna hold you to high standards because I want you to be able to get to where you're supposed to get that in state, that purpose of your life. And if you're on the wrong track, I'm gonna correct you in the right way to get you yes. onto the right track. And then along the way, if I can do the fun things of inspiration and encouragement, I'll do that as well. And, you know, just think about as a parent, I've got three kids, Summer, Tiffany, and Noah are 19, 17, and 14. Amazing. And sometimes I get to use the fun techniques of inspiration and encouragement, and sometimes those middle ones, mm. but sometimes I've got to use the correction. And my kids are not going to tell you that I'm too soft on them. I've got very high standards. They probably would tell you they're too high for them. Um, but I do it because I love them. Mm. And I want them to unlock their potential to become the best possible version of themselves. And so to me, yes. it's just the opposite. If you are a servant leader who genuinely cares for your people, then your standards are going to be high. And you're going to employ those range of tools so that you can get your people those you've been entrusted with to where they belong. I love it. You've been speaking to your leadership style already. We were going to touch on that. Would you say, is there anything else you would add to your leadership style, your leadership DNA? And then has it evolved over time? Think of maybe yourself as a 30 year old leader. And then what about now at, at 50? Yeah. So I think that I have been fairly consistent, especially since that time where I had that crisis of the boss that basically said that dragon, you're not the guy hmm. in being reflective about the type of leader that I should be, mm -hmm. and then holding myself accountable to then making sure that I am that type of leader. Hmm. On day one, when I jump into a leadership job, I spend 75 minutes or so sharing my leadership philosophy with my subordinate leaders. And I do it in wow. part because I want them to get to know me. I do it in part because I want them to start adding tools to their leadership toolkit. I do it because I want them to know that we're on this journey of lifelong learners of leadership together. Mm. But I also do it because I want them to hold me accountable. And if I say that my leadership philosophy is to do this, and you start to see me do anything that deviates from that, then I tell them that I want you to call me on it. Yeah. And I want you to tell me, hey, boss, you said this was your priority or this was your philosophy. Explain how this action of yours jives with that because it seems like it won't match. Wow. And, and so maybe it's a little bit of just self-reinforcement, but the longer I have lived as a leader and I've been a commander in a variety of areas or a boss of thousands of people during the course of my career, but as I see the nature of people and that innate desire of love and purpose, and as I even read things, the most recent book I read on leadership was Do Hard Things. 
And there's a page in there, I think it's 242, that really talks about being the type of leader that I've described to you. And they did two studies. One of the studies was with 64 NCAA track teams. Hmm. And they assessed the type of coach that they had. And then they assessed the performance of the athletes. And literally, the athletes were more tough and ran faster who had the type of leader that I described than the ones that didn't. Wow. And then that same paragraph in there goes on to say that they studied a thousand different workers and the different leadership styles and the type of workers that had that type of leader were more resilient and they were more engaged and they had higher performance. Mm. And so the benefit is that by being that type of leader, not only is it morally the right thing to do, mm. but you're actually gonna get better performance out of individuals and your team by being that type of leader. And so to me, well, I've re refined the way I describe my leadership style over time. I think that I have just reinforced by what I have seen in people and organizations, the power of being that type of leader. Amazing, amazing. I don't, uh, you mentioned do hard things. I think my dad had me read a book also called Do Hard Things, but it was written by some college students at the time. I think it was Joshua and Brett Harris or something, but I don't think it's the same book. <laughs> no, so this one came out in 2022. It's nice. written by a guy who's known as a long distance runner. I think he's nice. a marathon uh, okay. expert. Uh, and it was just written and I love it. And I love it if for no other reason because of that awesome paragraph on that page wow. that goes into the details of those two studies. Yeah. And to me, they were massively convicting to reinforce the type of leadership style that I knew was a powerful one. I've got to, I've got to check that out right now. My, and maybe, maybe this isn't a great goal or needs to go higher, but it's 52 books this year, one per week. So I'm on track okay. so far. I'm enjoying it. My sister, Elisa gave me a great tip. She said, get the, either the audible book or the li like from li a library or you can get Libby or something like that. It's an app where you'll have the audio and the book. Cause for me, I'm a type seven Enneagram. So I'm very distracted easily. So that has, it's changed the game for me. So now I'm just reading through these books and I'm loving it. <laughs> well, think about all of that raw material that you're absorbing, right? We yeah. talked about your sum total of those things, including what you read. Yeah. And to me, I think you become a better human being and certainly a better leader as you absorb these lessons that are experiences for free. Yes. So that you don't have to stumble through life as trial and error, but you learn from those that have gone on before us mm. and you can reinforce or change some things about you by what you learn from their mistakes instead of having to live out those mistakes. So good. Are there any other books that you feel like have shaped you or you feel like just are something that I, I can't miss for me? Yeah. So I've got four of them for you. Nice. The first one is a no-brainer. It's the Bible. Yeah, uh, it's God's a good one. <laughs> perfect instruction book in every possible way. Yes. Uh, and, and if we're not reading that as Christians daily at the beginning of our day, then fundamentally yeah. we're not setting ourselves on a successful foundation for the decisions that you're mm. going to have to make throughout the day. Mm. My two favorite secular leadership books mm -hmm. Are American Generalship okay. and Lincoln on Leadership. Okay. American Generalship is written by a guy named Purier that studied four star generals for 30 years and found the common denominators about what made them successful. And so each mm. chapter is a characteristic, and then it goes into how a variety of leaders have employed that characteristic. I'll give you a little bit of a teaser. The subtitle is Character is Everything. Yeah. And I love mm. that idea. But to me, I don't like books from leadership theorists. Okay. I love books about leaders or by mm. leaders. And so the reason I like it is because it talks about leadership theory, but then mm. it oozes with history about how real leaders applied to those characteristics. And Lincoln on leadership is kind of the same for Abraham Lincoln, where every chapter is a characteristic. Uh, I think um, Phillips is the guy that wrote that book. And um, it goes through a characteristic and how Lincoln embodied that characteristic. Wow. And so those two, I think, are just home run leadership yeah. books. And then the book that most intrigued me during this last year is Everything Sad is Untrue, A True Story. Okay. It's written by a guy who was an immigrant from Iran, ended up in Oklahoma, and it's just a powerful story about the human condition. Hmm. And it was on a bunch of these bestseller 
uh, or most best regarded lists, okay. including things like the Wall Street Journal and NPR, which normally don't agree on anything, wow. <laughs> uh, but they do about this book. And I just thought it was an awesome expose about this guy's life story hmm. and a definition or a description of the human condition. Amazing. Bonus question. If you could have lunch with any historical figure, who, who would it be? So, so Jesus would be the easy one. Okay, okay. I'm not going to expound upon that because I think that's an Excluding obvious one. Excluding God, have, yes. We, I'll, for I'll, have, sure yep, I'll have an opportunity, <laughs> uh, hopefully, in, in heaven to spend yes. uh, some quality time with him for throughout sure. eternity. I love George Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially I love the George Washington that led our American Revolutionary soldiers in the very tough winter at Valley Forge in 1777 mm -hmm. to 1778. Wow. That was a pivotal winter for our nation. We had entered camp there in Valley Forge after two and a half years of the Revolutionary War starting in April of 1775 mm -hmm. with no real large scale victories. Mm -hmm. We had had some skirmishes and successes in Trenton or Princeton or Dorchester Heights, but we hadn't won a large force battle. Mm -hmm. And how George Washington during those cold, harsh winter days and nights in Valley Forge kept that team together and ultimately created during that time a professional force that emerged from camp to win their first large scale victory in 1778 is a fascinating study on leadership. And so yeah. I would love to spend time with George Washington and I would love to specifically talk to him about that cold hard winter mm -hmm. and the leadership lessons that he learned and what I could absorb from those things in order to maximize the potential of the people around me. I think my dad would say the same thing, George Washington. Not only did my dad read me the encyclopedia and, and random history books for my bedtime stories at age six to 10, he read me a lot of stories about George Washington. <laughs> and he gave me the Georgisms book that he wrote in, you know, you know, as a, as a teen or something like that. I remember that very well. By the way, your dad's library is extremely impressive and his <laughs> knowledge of history is encyclopedic. Yes. And so I could only imagine growing up in the Rasmussen household and having an amazing <laughs> mom and dad and two sisters like you've got mm. and how that shaped you as an individual and a human being. <sighs> yeah, I'm so, so grateful. I love my family. Elisa, we saw her for the first time in four years because of COVID. They couldn't get over here from Thailand. So we just had the most beautiful couple of weeks or so this summer with all five of us. It's amazing. Uh, that is great. And yeah. I know Jay uh, took cello lessons from my wife no way. Uh, back at West Coast Baptist, and, nice. and they have a good kindred friendship and spirit, and that's so hopefully so, they're all doing well. That's so cool, because he played cello on our, it's called My Soul Restored with Amy, Elisa, and I, and that's, I didn't know that your wife was a huge part of that. It's awesome. Oh, no, you guys have such a musically talented family in <laughs> addition you. to all your other talents, and so I love listening to you all in older CDs from yeah. Lancaster yeah. and some of the newer stuff as well i love it i love well the last thing and thank you so much for your time again i wasn't sure how this would go or and you you've been amazing like and I've, I've learned so much i can't wait to watch it again and take copious notes i call it my second brain which is essentially just everything that i hear or listen to or learn i try to get organized in my second brain you know but i can't wait to get this into my second brain and review it consistently because you're the man. That's the bottom line. <laughs> no, I, I have learned a lot over the course of my life, and I've made my mistakes, and I've yeah. learned from them. And so, no, I'm just honored that we get to chat. But you said you've it. got one more question. I love so it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's if you could do it all over again, is there anything that you would do differently? There is a phrase that I learned at one of the colleges that I went to called environmental scanning. And the idea is mm. that you need to be intentional about not just focusing on the things that you're doing today or those things that you're officially responsible for, but in order to best do those things, you need to look up and out and understand the context in which you're operating. Hmm. And I don't think I did that very well until around that time I was a squadron commander in 2009 and hmm. maybe not even until I graduated from that experience in 2011. But I learned that phrase and it really stuck with me that if I'm going to do my best in the day to day tasks that are part of my job or my life, then I best do that by understanding the bigger picture and the context in which I operate. And so I've started to be a little bit more intentional about looking up and out and engaging in opportunities or in or, or items within my calendar or on my list of things to do that are broadening me instead of deepening me.
Mm. And I think that that's a critical thing that I missed out on before maybe 2009. You know, I think about going to college and I did very well in my studies in aerospace engineering as an undergrad, but there were probably some opportunities there in Cambridge where I could have gone to lectures or learned from some people in areas outside of that area I was studying. And I think I missed out on that because I was wow. too unilaterally focused on being awesome at the thing that I was specifically working on. And I think through my Air Force career as a younger officer, I was too engaged in just doing great at that task or that role. And I don't think that I did as well as I could have because I didn't look up and out and understand the broader picture. And so to me, I've tried to do some things intentionally about reading the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post daily or mm. foreign affairs or foreign policy or intentionally intent attending engagements that are far afield from the normal things that I would be working on. Mm -hmm. So I can not just be deep, but I can be broad. And yeah. I think it's important as you grow up and as you gain more responsibility to be broad versus deep. You can't get there if you're not deep and proven an expert in the thing that you're responsible for. But at some stage, it should shift so that you're doing more of this and less of this. In fact, mm. at some point, wow. this should shrink so that you can broaden. Wow. And I could have done a better job juggling that earlier on in my career. And I probably missed out on broadening unique opportunities that mm. I could have seized upon to be a better human being earlier in my life. Um, and I think I missed out because I wasn't intentional about this thing called environmental scanning. So interesting. I don't know if anyone's ever shared that with me. So I'm going to take that to heart and I'm going to, I'm going to do that. That's beautiful. No, I think, I think as a 30 year old who's, yeah. uh, who's doing awesome at the various elements of your life, mm. that maybe if you step up and out, and yes. consider some other things that you could broaden yourself on, mm. I think would pay dividends in whatever it is that you're supposed to do tomorrow and next year and next decade. This has been awesome, better than I thought it could be. So thank you, thank you, thank you just for touching my family personally, just for being someone who's, thank you for your service to our country and for touching thousands, millions of people through your service. And I'm just so grateful for that. And thank you for just who you are as a person and just seeing you from afar. I know we live across the country from each other, but just who you are to your family and the impact that they're and your kids were, are ultimately going to have because of the person that you are. And just the impact this conversation has had on me. And Oh, I'm just I'm just so excited. I, you know, January just ended, but the beginning of 2023, I'm just feeling over, overflowing with just gratitude and excitement and this conversation has been a huge part of that and I just I can't wait to just keep it going so, well, well thank no, you. much like much like I said that my desire is to maximize impact I know that that is your desire in these areas that you mm -hmm. believe you're called into and so to me it's just an uh, an extension of my desire to make an impact by investing in somebody that I, I respect it. and trust and like, like you. Right. And the Rasmussen's have had a huge impact on me. Mm. And so to some extent, it's just paying it forward to cycle back to spending time with you. And hopefully some of the things I said help, uh, and hopefully they help you and whoever you decide to share this with, it's been a blessing. I so appreciated spending time with you. And I know this is a little bit of a re-attack, but mm. offline after we stopped recording, we talked a little bit about what I think my purpose is going forward. And I don't 100% know what that is. I intentionally retired from the military because I think there's something far more impactful I can do for people in our nation by getting out than staying in. And going forward, I know that I'm doing some keynote speaking and I am probably writing a book and I'm on a board and I'm doing some consulting, but all of those things are maybe leading up to something that is more national, multi-generational impact. And so if it's possible just to share with those that may watch this, to go to johntykert.com. And John Tykert is my name on LinkedIn as well. But if you wanna follow a little bit about this journey that I'm on to maximize impact, then those are some places you can do it. And if it's helpful to you, or if there's something that I can do, Mark, for you or anybody who listens or watches um, to this, then I'm happy to do so and just reach out via those media. The best conversation with a general I have ever had in my life. <laughs> the only one. So, so it there's could have been that really too. good or it could have been really bad. <laughs> it was the best. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it.